so you're in for a treat this afternoon. Uh, talk title is Everybody Hurts Content for Kindness. Please welcome Sarah to the stage. Hello. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm going to start today with a story. And it's a story about um, last summer. I was about to go to a new doctor for the first time. They sent me a link to a new patient form that they wanted me to fill out before coming in. And so I click the link and I start going through all of those typical fields. I'm answering questions like, do you smoke? Has anybody in your family ever had a stroke? And then suddenly, sandwiched between all of that normal stuff, I got the question. Have you ever been sexually abused or assaulted? There is no context. There was no indication for why they were asking me this question, who was going to have access to this information, what they wanted to do with it. There was no box to tick for, well, yeah, actually, but you know, that's not really why I'm coming to your office today. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it, but I don't know you and I don't want to talk about it with you. And I'd kind of rather just get on with it. There was no space to breathe. There was just this tiny little binary for a story that didn't feel binary to me at all. I thought about what I should do next. I thought, what happens if I say yes? Who am I gonna have to talk to about this? What are they gonna say to me? And I thought about what happens if I say no, if I lie. And I thought, you know, I lied about this for a really long time. This isn't a story I'm willing to lie about anymore. And so finally, I check yes. I go in for my appointment. I'm in the doctor's office, and she says to me, so, you were sexually assaulted. It's not a question, but she pauses expectantly. I wait. I'm silent. I say yes. I wait some more. I wait long enough for it to get awkward. I think about explaining, but then I realize that story is mine to share or not share. Eventually, she says, I'm sorry that happened to you. And she moves on with her checkup. I don't. I sit there thinking about it. It's rolling itself over in my head. It's rolling itself over in my head the next day and the next week. And what I realized coming out of this is that I don't know what your personal history is. I don't know what any of you have been through. But what I do know is that all of you have one. All of you have gone through something. Because every single person has a life that's complicated. And we don't know who's carrying what around with them. We're all carrying some kind of burden, some kind of loss, some kind of pain. We're all carrying something that might just be difficult to explain. And because we don't know what people are going through, we don't necessarily know how they're going to react. We don't know what's going to trigger a memory. We can't know what's hard for them. There are days when I can stand on a stage and tell a large room of people that yes, I was sexually assaulted, and that yeah, it filled me with shame for a long time. And I can tell you that I'm not ashamed anymore. And then there are days when saying those words makes me want to cry. And sometimes I don't know what reaction I'm going to have. I don't know which of the many feelings things are going to stir up. But that's life, right? Life is messy. Life is a lot of things all at once. There's such a range of emotions that people are feeling, oftentimes more than one emotion at the same time. And so I started thinking a lot about what we mean when we say that we're making things for humans. Oftentimes, I think what we really mean is that we're making interfaces for people to have moments of joy, to have the new relationships, the new babies, the new jobs, the things that we congratulate and celebrate. We make shiny, happy people to go in shiny, happy wireframes to result in these shiny, happy interfaces. And so what I started thinking a lot more about is how do we make things for whole humans? 
How do we write and design for people who are difficult to categorize? For people who are going through any number of internal problems? For people who have conflicted and complicated reactions to the products that we make for them? For the people that we ask to fill out a form field without thinking about how it's going to make them feel? Whenever I start thinking about the people that I'm making things for, the people that my clients are making things for, they're using the products and services I touch. I think about this talk that Paul Ford gave at the School of Visual Arts a couple years ago as a commencement address. In that talk, he said, when I look out at this room, I see a comparatively small number of faces. But I also see a trillion heartbeats. Not your own heartbeats, but those of your users. And he says, if we're going to ask them to spend their heartbeats on us, on our ideas, how can we be sure, far more sure than we are right now, that they spend those heartbeats wisely? I think about this question every day. What would it mean for me to spend my users' heartbeats wisely? And what I've come to in that is that we have an opportunity, all of us do. We have an opportunity to make every decision we make an act of kindness. To make sure that when we write, when we build, when we design, every little interaction can have kindness at its core. And that's what I want to talk about today. And to do that, what I'd like to do is share a few principles with you. Principles that I've been working on over the past several months to try to express this and make this something that's practical for all of us in our work. The first of those is to rethink what we think of when we think of normal. To do that, I'd like to have you do just a quick little activity right there where you're sitting. Don't worry, you don't have to stand up. You don't have to talk to anybody. I just want you to imagine your user. Just take a moment quietly right there in your seat and imagine who your user is. Think about them. Get them in your mind. Can you picture them? Can you hear them? All right, you see them in your head? I want you to think about this. Who did you picture? What gender were they? What race were they? How old were they? What did you visualize? Did you visualize where they live, where they're from? Do you have a sense of how they feel at this moment, what they're going through in their lives? Do you have a sense of what they're doing when they're interacting with your product or with your service? If we're being honest with ourselves, I think a great many of the products made from our industry are made for some very narrow people. We end up with a lot of products that are designed and that work for people who are all straight, white men who live in a city, have disposable income. I've talked to a bunch of you here today. You seem kind and smart and lovely, and you don't seem like you're walking around with Silicon Valley blinders on. So I'm sure that for most of you, you're not only thinking about that narrow of a dynamic, but you are probably thinking about specific audiences in your work. Because you'd make sense, right? We're all trying to target some kind of user. You can't go out and try to target everybody. So maybe you're saying like, oh yes, this product is really targeted at um, families who make more than 100,000 a year. Or maybe this is particularly targeted at college students or this or that, right? There's nothing specifically wrong with having a target audience. There's lots of things right with it. But oftentimes when we have target audiences, I think we're not answering, answering one very important question in our work. What if we're wrong? What if the way that we've envisioned our audience is too narrow for the people who are actually trying to use our product? What happens? Do things still work? Or are we positioning our copy and our design in a way that leaves people out and that alienates them and that causes harm? I'm gonna talk about an example of this that I heard about from a woman named Maggie Delano. Maggie Delano, um, is a researcher and um, she's really interested in quantified self and she wrote a Medium article a few months ago. Um, the article title I think is pretty good at explaining what the article is going to be about. I tried tracking my period and it was even worse than I could have imagined. So what she did is she went out looking for period tracking apps. And a period tracking app, if you're not in the know, is basically a way that you can keep track of when your period is going to come. And so she tried out a whole series of products, and she found it really frustrating. And one of the products that she tried was called Glow. So I started reading this article, and I was really fascinated with what she was talking about. So I, of course, had to download Glow myself and see what this was all about. So I download Glow. And 
I will say just first off that everything you're gonna see in this example, um, it's just me messing around with data. I don't have any personal data in this app, so there's nothing that's actually personal to me here. But I get this app and I start onboarding. And the first thing you see when you get there is that you're supposed to choose your journey. See that up there? Y'all, it's a period. It is not a journey. <laughs> I can't speak for all women, but I don't know anybody who would tell me that their period is a journey. <laughs> and I think, is this just trying to be cute and warm? Is this just trying to make things like pleasant and nice for people? But okay, you move on from your journey. Take a look at what your options are. You could be on three journeys and use Glow, only three. You are either avoiding pregnancy, you are trying to conceive, or you are having fertility treatments. That's it. There's nothing else to do in this screen except for select one. What if none of those apply to you? That's the experience that Maggie Delano had. Her partner's a woman. She figured she was doing pretty well at avoiding pregnancy. <laughs> and trying to conceive and fertility treatments didn't apply. So right there, right from onboarding, she's completely alienated and excluded from this app, this app that she wants to use to track her period. So what this does from step one is it creates a system of false categorization. It tells the user that they have to fit into one of these predefined categories. And because it starts with false categories, what it does is it carries that through throughout the entire experience. Even if you go ahead and click a screen, which I go ahead and do, I still end up with an experience that doesn't fit my needs at every single moment because I'm reminded that it's designed for somebody who isn't me. So everything that we do when we start selecting categories for people, when we start trying to put people into boxes that they're not defining for themselves, everything that comes after that starts to be a problem. The things that we might think are gonna make it fun and friendly and simple and human at the very beginning, at that onboarding stage, might be just the very things that make it not work down the line. So I went ahead and continued, of course, because science, I needed to see what was next. So I continued on into the app, and I wanted to see what else Glow had in store for me. So I selected that I was avoiding pregnancy. And so I go in and I start playing around with all the little things in the app. And one of the things you can do as you're playing around in there is you can um, enter information about a given day. And so some of the data that they want to have about a given day is they want to know, you know, like, were you on your period? How did you feel? All of these different questions. And one of the questions they ask is if you had intercourse. And so, you know, okay, fine. That's probably relevant to whether or not, you know, your, to how your period is working. Sure. So I went ahead and said, okay, let's see what happens if I enter this. So I entered that I had intercourse, and then I entered, um, they wanted a birth control method. I said, okay. So I selected the morning after pill. Let's see what this does. So I did that, and then all of a sudden, it was like, okay, great, and it gave me this screen. I had intercourse. Do you see the heart there? <laughs> I wanna call something out to you. I did not select that icon. Glow did. And that might be cute, and sweet and fine for many users in many circumstances. But the question is, what if it's not? What if the sex you had wasn't a good thing? What if it was bad? What if you regret it? What if your condom failed and that's why you selected morning after pill? What if you were assaulted? There's many reasons, large to tiny, that you might not be feeling a heart icon just because you marked in this app that you had sex. But Glow decided for me how I felt about it, right? Glow decided. It made an assumption about what my feelings were. In Glow's mind, everybody using this app is in a loving, committed relationship, having great sex every time they use the app. Those are the only people who can use this app and have it feel right. Now, I hope everybody who wants to be in a loving and healthy relationship is in a loving and healthy relationship. But the reality of life is just so much weirder than that. And to only design for that one case, to only make that one experience good and every other experience broken, to me feels woefully narrow. It doesn't take into account what people are actually like. 
But Glow wasn't done. Glow really loves to be in charge of me. So, for example, here's a screen that says you're having a period, okay? Okay, this is a period day. The copy says, snuggle away. And I guess it's trying to be cute, right? Like, I guess it's trying to make it, like, fun somehow. But what I don't understand is this. Why is this app giving me permission about whether or not I should be snuggling? If I'm using an app that's theoretically designed to give me more information and empower me about my own body, why is it making the decisions for me? Why is it giving me permission to do anything? I think it's important to remember when we're talking about the things we design, we have to never forget who's in charge. We have to never forget who should be making the choices and the things we create. I want to use an app to help me feel more comfortable in my choices and not less. Interestingly, Glow is not just interested in your sex life. It also wants to know about all of these other things, like whether you got any exercise during a given day and your emotions. And some of that might make sense, you know, perhaps if you were doing fertility treatments or something, like where you'd want to gather more information. One of the things it wants to ask you about, though, is whether or not you've had any alcohol. And so I was filling that out, and I was like, OK, well, let's see what happens. If I say, yes, sure, I had alcohol, and ask you how many drinks. And so I said, oh, I had, let's say I had four drinks. I'm going to throw myself a very small little party here in this app. So I put down that I had four drinks, right? And here's what I get. I get, you had many drinks. <laughs> Thanks, Glow. And I'm not sure how well you can read all of that, but it says, there's nothing wrong with having a drink now and then, but frequent heavy drinking can lead to blah, 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 blah. And I think, wait a second. One time, I put down that I had four drinks in an app that's about tracking my period. And they've decided that what I actually need from them is all of this other stuff. It's trying to be all of these things for me that I never asked it to be. I said I was interested in tracking my period, and Glow told me that I needed to be on a journey that they were defining. It told me what to care about. It told me how I feel. It told me about me. There are so many assumptions built into a product like this. And it got me thinking, what kind of assumptions am I building into my own work? What kinds of assumptions am I making when I'm working with my clients, when I'm making content recommendations, when I'm designing an interaction? And in what ways are those assumptions limiting the people who want to use this service and the people who feel like they can use this service? In Maggie Delano's case, when she wrote about this, she said that Glow and other apps like it were making assumptions that were just another example of technology telling queer, unpartnered, infertile, and are women uninterested in procreating that they weren't even women. It was so off-putting, she couldn't use any of the apps that she tried. And further, it's telling women that the only women worth designing technology for are those women who are capable of conceiving and who are not only in a relationship, but in a sexual relationship, and in a sexual relationship with someone who can potentially get them pregnant. It wasn't just off-putting, it was alienating. It was telling her that it just wasn't for her. She didn't belong there. So when I look at all the decisions that an app like Glow made, they seem to have made a lot of decisions to make things smooth and seamless and fun. They wanted to make it friendly and human, all of the joy of tracking your period. But I look at that and I think, for whom? For whom? Who gets to have that experience? And who gets left behind? I think we do a lot better in our work when we start asking users what they want. When we start being a lot more careful about making assumptions about the categories that they fall into, and we give people the power to make their own choices about what they need. But maybe even more important than that, maybe even more valuable than that, is we need to be able to accept nuance in people's replies. It's not just about giving people three options to choose from. It's about allowing people to define themselves. The more that we make products and services that really get into people's lives in intimate and personal ways, the more that we sort of bump up against this problem. This problem of having our services try to define us in ways that don't feel right. 
I mean, if you were Glow, you could easily, easily modularize the different pieces of this app and make it so that you could allow people to select what they actually wanted to track, right? It'd be pretty easy to allow people to pick the things that they were interested in tracking. There are lots of women who just want to track their cycle length and when it's going to happen. Like, they just want to know, like, when do I need to buy tampons? And some people want to track maybe their mood and their feelings, too. They want to see sort of how things shift along the way. And maybe there's other people who are definitely most interested in figuring out, you know, pregnancy risk, right? And they're looking at a, at a birth control scenario. And maybe then there's other people who want to track things like their fertility windows. Or they want to keep track of, you know, when they are having intercourse because they're trying to get pregnant. And that might make them more interested in tracking some of that general health information. More than somebody who's just using it as a period tracker. But ultimately, all of this is, is about saying, we need to come from a place of kindness where we let people define themselves, rather than saying that their identities aren't OK. Which brings me to my next principle, which is about making space for people. Making space for real people to exist in the things we design. To talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about names, because names are such a core part of identity. I know my name is pretty important to me, and I'm frustrated every time I see a field like this, which cuts off the last two letters, which is very typical. My name breaks things on the internet constantly, right? It just does not fit into the form field. And, you know, I try not to get upset about it, I try not to take it personally, but it's frustrating, because it feels like I don't get to fit into that field. I don't get to represent myself on Twitter as I represent myself in everyday life, because it doesn't fit in their system. But that's a small thing in comparison to what Shane Creeping Bear felt. Shane Creeping Bear is a Native American, and he had his name rejected by Facebook last year. And when they rejected his name, what they told him was that his name wasn't approved, that it didn't meet Facebook standards. And it wasn't just Shane Creeping Bear. It was also Lance Brown Eyes. It was Robin Kills the Enemy. It was Lena, Dana Lonehill. It was a number of people with native last names who were told that their na names did not meet the standard and could not be used. Now, Facebook has a real name policy. You're supposed to use the authentic name that you use in real life. And we could talk about whether or not they should have that policy, but they do. And Facebook wasn't just saying, though, that they think their names might be fake. What they were saying was, your name wasn't approved. Your name wasn't approved. It looks like that name violates our name standards. You can enter an updated name again in one minute to make sure the updated name complies with our policies. Please read more about what names are allowed on Facebook. They weren't just questioning the authenticity of the name. What they were saying is that your name is wrong. That's how I read that. Your name is wrong. And when I see your name is wrong, I also see, you know, you don't belong here because your name violates our standards. If that's your actual name that you've entered and you're told it violates things, that it doesn't fit Facebook, it feels like you don't fit and you're not wanted. It also says that you need to change. You need to change your name to fix the problem. You have to be different to be here. Now, I used to have a slide that talked about an alternative example, something that Facebook could do instead. But just a couple weeks ago, I got word that they changed this. So I'll show you what they actually have now. Now, it says something I think fits a lot better. It says, help us confirm your name. So the headline starts. And then it talks about why they, they have people use their authentic names on Facebook so people know who they're connecting with. But it's not just the copy. It's also the interaction itself. It's not just try again, which sounds pretty judgmental. But it's two choices. Go through the process of confirming your name or update it to something else if you're not using your real name. What this does is a couple of things. It feels a lot friendlier feels a lot more welcoming. But it's also more honest about the fact that the system is imperfect, rather than assuming that your identity is the problem here. It gives people a way for them to go through a process to do something about it, instead of only giving them one option, which is to change. It says, oh, sorry, those are the two, two options that it has. And what it says is, you know, 
we could be wrong. It says maybe we're wrong here. It also says we want to fix this. We want to fix this with you. We're not just trying to reject you. We're not telling you you violate things. We're trying to make this better. And it also says, here's what you can do about it. Now, if you got that message, you might still not like having to send in copies of your driver's license and sending in extra documentation to prove your name. You might not like having to go through extra steps to get your name approved on Facebook. But at least you'd feel like there's space within Facebook's universe for you to exist. All it takes is us coming from a place where we're adjusting to our users' needs, rather than constantly asking them to fit ours, to fit our narrow definitions of what we think a name looks like. Because the truth is, no matter how well we think we understand our users, no matter how well we think we know what a real name is, people will surprise us. There are things we are going to get wrong. When we make space for real people, when we're kind to people as they go through that process, we show them that they do belong in our products and our services. But to get there, we have to do something. And that's set aside some ego. And I will tell you that that's very difficult to do for anybody, I think for people in general. And I want to tell you an example that we had at Alyssa Part. So I've been the editor-in-chief of Alyssa Part for three and a half years or so now. And I want to share with you something that our copy used to say when it was talking about writing for us. So this is a snippet from our About Us page from a couple years ago, where I would talk about you know, why you might want to write for a list apart. It says this, maybe you can be one of us, the few, the proud, the ALA contributing authors. A list apart is written by the community it serves, designers, developers, et cetera, et cetera. Publishing in ALA confers prestige and has helped some of our authors gain book deals or find favor with the editors of print magazines. Interested in writing for us? See the contribute page for guidelines. So this copy was written at a time when what a goal was to make people who wrote for ALA feel like it was a big deal and to feel like proud of this and to feel like authors were special. So it was coming theoretically from a good place. But it's very, very focused on sort of this elite feel. And then if you did click through to that contribute page and you actually read that page, it said this. It says, so, you want to write for a list apart magazine. What we're looking for. We want to change the way our readers work. Whether that means introducing a revolutionary CSS technique with thousands or dozens of potential applications, challenging the design community to ditch bad practices, or refuting common wisdom about, say, screen readers. If your article can do that, we want to see it. I read that, and I think that what it's really saying is we're really important. We are a very important place, and you should feel like this is an important thing, and you should definitely be taking us very seriously. And it also kind of says, you know, you're probably not good enough. Our authors get book deals. Um, you probably couldn't write for us anyway. And maybe most of all, it kind of says we don't need you. It kind of has this air of like, we're doing just fine without you. Everybody would want to write for us. I started looking at this copy at a time when I started asking people if they wanted to write for a list apart. I was kind of reaching out to people I saw in the industry, people I'd see who give a talk, or people I knew who were smart and writing great things, and I'd say, you should write a thing. You've not written a thing. Why don't you write a thing? And I started hearing this response from people. I started hearing people say things like, that seems, that seems like a really big deal. Or, I don't, I don't think I have anything to say. Or, oh no, I, I mean, I, I don't. I couldn't do that. That sounds, that sounds like for people way more important than me. And the fact is, we do need people, right? Like, you don't have a magazine that's by and for the web community unless people will actually write for it. So I started looking at what we should be doing differently. I'm going to share with you the way the copy reads now. I wouldn't say this is necessarily the perfect final draft, but I would say it's the most recent copy that we've come up with. So what it says is right for us. Yes, you. We're always looking for new authors. 
says, if you've got an idea that will challenge our readers and move our industry forward, we want to hear about it. You don't need to wait for an idea that will redefine web design, though. Just aim to bring readers a fresh perspective on a topic that's keeping you up at night. Now, I don't think this is perfect. As I started looking at this carefully, I was like, you know, I'd probably get rid of that challenge verb. It's a little bit too like, aggressive. Like, challenging our readers sounds kind of like a big deal. And, and, you know, maybe we could tweak some things here. But what it does say, what it does say is that our authors matter to us. Yes, you. You could be one of them. It also says, you know, we want new authors. They're why we're here. It says that your ideas count. You don't have to redefine all the things. You don't have to have some idea that's going to blow everybody's mind ever. You just need to have something you're excited about and that's keeping you up at night, because that's probably enough. That's probably enough of an idea. And it really tells people that they're why we're here, because we're not a magazine unless we have people like you. Yes, you. But to do this, it, got, it, it made us get to a place where we had to swallow some pride. And we had to swallow some pride about who ALA is and the fact that it was like this web magazine that's been around since 1998 and that lots of people who've gone on to do big, great things have written for. And we had to talk to people in a way that would actually help them and make them feel confident doing what we wanted them to do. Which brings me to the next thing, which is about intention. Being intentional in everything that we write not just letting things happen, being intentional in every element we design. I want to tell another story to talk about this. Last year, I was applying to get my German passport. Now, I'm half German, and I've always been eligible, um, but I didn't have any documentation. And so I was going to the consul in Philadelphia, where I live. And I was bringing all of these things with me, right? Like, so notarized birth certificates and copies of green cards and parents' marriage licenses and all of this background information. An entire story of a life, a narrative built out of documents, right? So I get all my stuff and I go into the consul. And I'm sitting at the consul's office and I'm filling out forms. Form after form, filling out to kind of prove I am who I say I am and my mother is who she says she is, et cetera. As I'm going through them, I hit upon this one form. And it says, Ich bin das blank Kind meiner Mutter. I'm the whatever th child of my mother. And as I start filling this out, the first thing I start doing is I start putting this two there on the page. And I'm like halfway through filling that out in pen when it hits me. I'm not precisely the second child. I'm the third. Suddenly I'm not filling out forms anymore. I'm thinking about our house back in California, and I'm about six years old. And I have all these photo albums spread out on the dining room table with my mom. I really loved going through photo albums as a kid. I loved seeing my parents live before I was born. I loved asking questions about like, who are those people? Why do they have such funny glasses? And why is everybody wearing ponchos? Um, and so, you know, I'd go through all these photo albums, and I would get to this one section. I can remember it so clearly, how the order of pictures go. There's these pictures of a trip to Europe when my brother is a tiny toddler. So there's my older brother running around in some, you know, pigeon-covered square somewhere. There's my grandmother at her house in Munich. And then there's Jamie. Jamie never left the rural Italian hospital where he was born. He was too premature to fight off the infection that he caught there. Jamie lived for 13 days. Jamie is a brother I never had, but he's a child that my mom had, and she feels this loss deeply. And so I'm thinking about that moment, that moment sitting around the kitchen table with her, and the look on her face, the distance that she has. She's impenetrable. I can't get to her. I remember hugging her, kind of like trying to get in her lap. I want to bring her back to the moment with me. But she's somewhere else right now. But of course, I'm not six years old in California. I'm at the consul's office. 
I have forms to fill out. I get it back together, bring myself back to attention, try to figure out what to say. Eventually, I try to write something in the margins. I write, gestorben, 1982, dead, 1982. I don't know if that's the right thing to say. Certainly don't know if it's the right thing to say in German. Move on with my form. And what I realize is that every single field we collect carries weight. Everything we ask for is a demand for us to define ourselves. It demands that we reveal ourselves. And sometimes that's okay. I mean, citizenship is a big deal. It's not like I'm just buying a bus ticket. And so I'm not upset necessarily that they wanted to get personal information from me, that they want to know about my family history and my background. That might be fine. We can't always get rid of form fields that could be weird and problematic. We can't always change that, right? Because we can't always predict when a question is going to create a problem for somebody. But whenever we ask about identity, we take on risk. And the best thing that we can do to minimize that risk is to make sure that we're really asking why. Make sure that everything we collect, we're collecting for a good reason. That we're not collecting data just because we want to, or just because we can, or just because that's what all forms ask for. And I think this is something we can consider, all of us, in whatever role we're in in our work. Every time we start asking for information, we can do a better job of asking why. A tool for doing that that I really like is a question protocol. Um, and that's a technique that was designed originally for surveys, but actually works really neatly for web work as well. Um, Carolyn Jarrett talks a lot about them, um, and she wrote a book with Jerry Gaffney a few years ago called Forms That Work. And they talk quite a bit about question protocols in there. And what they say is that it's really just a way that you can understand all the questions you ask and why you're asking them and who in your, in, or your, in your organization actually uses those answers. Are people actually doing anything with this information? You might even adjust this too to start getting a better sense of um, how are we using this information within the product itself? Because so much of what we're designing now, the kinds of like apps and experiences we design, we're using user data to feed into algorithms or to set preferences or to do something that defines the product experience that people will have. Do we understand all of those things? Have we really thought about the way that we're using the information? And have we had a conversation about whether that information is needed to make the experience work? What happens if people don't give us good data? Are we asking all the questions we need to be asking? The thing about a question protocol, though, is that it's not going to prevent every problem. It's not going to prevent every scenario where somebody might have a reaction to a piece of information they're asked for. Because, as writer Roxane Gay has said, everything is a trigger for someone. You don't know all of your users' histories. You can't prevent all other touchy subjects from coming up. But what you can do is train yourself to be intentional in everything that you communicate. What we can do is ensure that no decision is left unquestioned. What we can do is make sure we're only asking for what we need and that we're communicating why we need it. And that we're being fair and kind to our users when we're asking for information from them. The next thing I want to talk about is finding the fractures in the things we create, finding the places where they break down. To tell you about this, I want to tell you a story about my friend Eric Meyer. Eric's daughter Rebecca died on her sixth birthday last summer. And Eric's very well known in the web field for his work with web standards. He's written a lot of books on CSS. And so many of you might follow him. And some of you probably know this story already because he wrote about her illness all the way through. And then last Christmas, after she died, he wrote about Facebook's year in review. I'm sure some of you saw this because this blew up pretty big. But what they did is Facebook wanted him to create a year in review. And so they inserted this on his timeline as an example of what a year in review could look like. It's a little co collection of snapshots of all the different moments of your year that were popular. So you can kind of relive the past and share that with your friends. So they wanted him to create a year in review, and this is how they promoted it. Except his year was a picture of his dead daughter, surrounded by dancers 
and balloons and streamers. It says, Eric, here's what your year looked like, exclamation point and all. And he looked at that and he thought, you know, that is what my year looked like. But this isn't an experience I want. I don't want to relive my daughter's death on Facebook, surrounded by a party. And of course, it wasn't just Eric and Rebecca. It was all kinds of things. Tons of people had crappy years. This is an example of somebody whose apartment burned down. That was the most interacted with photo that he'd posted all year. And then there are people who said, I'm not even going to show you my year in review because all it is is like me talking about writing an obituary. All it is is highlights about a friend's death. Now, in these scenarios, it's really easy for us to say, that's just an edge case. It's a statistically small number of people who've had an experience like this. And most people are going to have a good experience. It's easy to write things off as an edge case when you're talking in the abstract. But when I look at Rebecca's face and I think about my friend, I'm not comfortable calling that an edge case. So this is something Eric and I have been talking about quite a lot. And we've started kind of collaborating on this. And we've decided that language is really part of the problem here. When you define something as an edge case, you're saying it's something you don't have to care about. You're allowing it to be a fringe concern. You're pushing it to the corners, to the margins. So instead, what him and I have been talking about is the idea that it's a stress case. We want to bring it right to the center and say, stress cases are where we should focus. Because stress cases show us the weaknesses in our work. When we put stress on something, we start to see the fractures. It's like when you go to the doctor's office and they do a stress test, or they put you on the treadmill and they hook you up, they want to know how much your heart can take before you start getting that abnormal rhythm. We want to know how much stress our content and our designs can be under before they break down, before our intent breaks down, and before those fractures have the opportunity to hurt somebody. The thing about content particularly, like microcopy type stuff, is that it breaks really easily. This is an email that my friend Kevin Hoffman got from Medium when he wrote a post about his friend Elizabeth who had died of cancer. So he gets this pretty soon after he's posted the article. It is an email to let him know how many likes it's gotten, and it's kind of letting him know he's only had a few recommends on Medium, but it wants to make sure he's feeling okay that he's only at three right now. And it says, fun fact, Shakespeare only got two recommends on his first Medium story. Fun facts create a real risk for people. Because those fractures, those places where the content that we intended to have, the experience we were trying to create, and the realities of our users, and the realities of the content that they created, where those things have dissonance, that creates alienation. In fact, um, Medium got in touch with me like a couple weeks ago because they saw that I had written about this. And they apologize, and they've actually removed um, the offending fun fact from the set of strings that can go out in these emails. They took a bunch of them out. And now they're like, we got to figure out what we're going to do about this. They want to have somebody come in and sort of figure out what they can do to keep the experience something interesting and friendly, but that's not going to be so worrisome, that's going to fit more scenarios. And it's a tough task. It's a tough task when we say we want to be friendly and welcoming to also try to think about where that's going to break down. A company that I think has done a lot of work on this is MailChimp. And I'm bringing MailChimp up because they're really known for their voice and tone. They're known for having a lot of humor. They're known for being a, such a friendly brand, right? And in fact, some of you might be familiar with MailChimp's This Not That list. Kate Kiefer Lee has talked about this quite a lot. They're going to be fun, but not childish. Clever, but not silly, et cetera, et cetera. They have all these guidelines to help them bring that quirky, funny personality that they have alive on the page. And they also have this great site, voiceandtone.com. Um, this site is so useful and so helpful, whether or not you work at MailChimp, for thinking about how we think about voice, tone, and emotion. You can go there and you can see all these different content types that they have and how they can keep users' feelings in mind as they're going through them. So whether somebody is, for example, getting a compliance notification or they're sending an email that um, they've just got a notification that their campaign has gone out. 
And then it explains the different feelings they might be having at these different moments and shows examples of copy that follows the voice and tone guidelines. It's really helpful. But one of the things voiceandtone.com used to have is these things called Freddy's jokes. Freddy is the chimp of MailChimp, and he's, you know, so he's their mascot. And he used to tell these weird and wonderful jokes all the time. But the thing is, MailChimp has actually taken that off of the site. They've pulled back from Freddy a bit in the last couple of years. They've deliberately pulled back from humor in their work, even though that's such a big part of their brand. So I talked to Kate Kiefer Lee about this. She's the head of content at MailChimp. And she said, you know, over the years, we've moved to a much more neutral voice. We focus on clarity over cleverness and personality. We're not in an industry that's associated with crisis, but we don't know what our readers and customers are going through. And our readers and customers are human, or people. They could be in an emergency, and they still have to use the internet. And that's true. Your users could be in an emergency, they could be in a crisis, they could be going through grief, they could be going through any number of things and still need to be interacting with your product or service for some reason. So what do we do about that? What do we do when we want to be fun and friendly and human and create these nice seamless experiences? I think one of the first questions we need to be asking is do I control the context that my content is appearing in? That was one of the big problems with Year in Review and one of the problems at Medium as well. The people who were creating that content they probably had examples in mind and in their comps, they were sort of like the typical posts that they expected. Year in review would be full of vacations, new baby being born, right? All these images of kind of good things that happen to a person in a year. And you know, maybe the medium example is, you know, I don't know, something about startups in San Francisco. And so you put those sample pieces of content in and you put your little pieces of microcopy in and you're like, yeah, this looks great. This is great. Fun facts are awesome here. But we need to start identifying, like, when, what is the ideal scenario that we're thinking of? Because that's typically what we're thinking about. And how can we take that ideal scenario that we're envisioning, take all of those happy things we're going to be putting in our comps, and imagine what the opposite of that would be like. We subvert all of the assumptions about how we think this thing should work and think about what happens if the worst thing happens. The worst thing goes in that little picture window. The worst thing goes into that little headline slot. How risky is it? How badly could our work fracture? And that's really the kindest thing we can do every time we design, is make sure that we're really thinking about the worst. Because if we're able to consider our users' needs at their worst moments in their lives, we can make the experience work for people when they're at their most vulnerable, most difficult times, then we can make them work better for everybody. Ultimately, everything I've talked about today, I think is really about compassion. Compassion is a term that we don't hear talked about that much on the web. It's something I don't hear coming up real often in our industry. It sounds like something that belongs with social services, or healthcare, where you need to kind of give care and support for people. But none other than Karen McGrain has talked about compassion as a concept that I think really applies to our work. A couple years ago at the IA Summit, she gave this talk where she said, you know, we're pretty good at being able to kind of get inside somebody else's head and sort of model their task. But that cognitive empathy, that's actually just one level of empathy. There's actually a much deeper level of it that you would call compassion. What that means is that you have genuine emotional feelings for the struggles that someone is going through, and you are spontaneously moved to help them because you feel them. What she's saying here is that compassion takes action. It's being moved to do something with our empathy. It's not enough to feel for our users. We have to go about the difficult work of helping them, even when that means, even when that means designing for more use cases than we thought, even if that means taking out that clever thing that we thought was so great even when it means that we have to do things a little bit differently than we wanted to. And because it's hard, I think compassion also takes a lot of courage. It takes courage to be like MailChimp and not just say, oh, lighten up when somebody can't take a joke. It takes courage to go inside yourself and say, you know, we might be a fun-loving, zany company, but that has a cost. 
It's hurting people's feelings. It's getting in their way. It's alienating some of our users. It takes courage to not have that knee-jerk reaction and instead come to terms that what you're doing might be hurting people and be willing to change. Because of that, I think compassion takes practice. It's a lot easier to be kind to people when they're standing in front of you. It's especially easy when you know what they're going through. It's a lot harder to bring that kindness to people you can't see. It's harder to retrain our brains to look at every single situation and look for the opportunities where we can make space for people, whole, real people. As Paul Ford has said, the only unit of time that matters is the heartbeats of those people. The more we make space for them, the more we'll be making things worth their time. So thank you for spending some heartbeats with me.